Hello, everyone. Hallelujah. Jesus is good. Amen. Amen. I just wanted to welcome you all, um, especially some of you that are new here to Harvesters, and just share about the person of Jesus. Because there's a reason why there's so much joy and shouting and so much expression in this place. And for some of you, this may be very different from what you're accustomed to, or you've may never seen this ever before. But, um, you know, if you imagine like a sports game or something like that, like a basketball game where everybody's cheering for their favorite team, you know, there are times in life when there's something worth shouting for. There's something worth praising. There's something worth laying down your life for. And, and the thing that we believe is that the person of Jesus is really the ultimate one that we should lay down our lives for. And um, for those of you who may have never heard of the gospel before, I just want to share the gospel with you. And the gospel really is good news about our ability to have a relationship with God and have eternal life with Jesus Christ. And when God created the heavens and the earth, he created man to have relationship with him. But what happened was Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 2 sinned against God. And so all of a sudden, they lost their connection with, with God himself. And because of that, they were covered in shame and they were covered in this sense that they had to strive to make things right. But the reality is that all of us, when we come into the world, we're going to mess up. We're going to get hurt. We're going to experience different things that cause us pain. And we try to overcome that by helping others or being good people. But the truth of the matter is that no matter what we do, it all falls short because nothing that we can do can really allow us to be satisfied in the love of God. And so the, the way that God answered that problem of the disconnect between man and God was he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, into the earth. And what Jesus did was he became a sacrifice. He took on upon himself everything that we did wrong when he went to the cross. And he shed his blood. He literally died for us. And then he was buried, and three days later, he was raised from the grave, showing us that only through Christ can we have life, even beyond death. And so for those of you who are here who maybe you, you've been in church or you've heard of the gospel, but the reality of Jesus Christ really laying his life down for you, it hasn't become a reality. I just want to share with you today that your hope can be found in Jesus. And I want to read this verse from John Chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus might be saved. So through Jesus, we get a chance to know God for the rest of our lives. We get joy and we have a relationship that will satisfy us beyond anything else in the world. And so that's why when you're here, there's such a culture of freedom and a culture of expression of joy and love and shouting and praise. And sometimes what happens is the Holy Spirit will even come into the room in such a way where the Holy Spirit will touch people's hearts, where they just begin to just experience just such breakthrough or such freedom, where they just want to laugh or shout and jump around. And so we just want to welcome you to enjoy that culture here and know that Wherever you are in your walk with God or whether you're wrestling with God, that there are people here that have experienced the love of God. You'll probably hear testimonies of how God has changed their life. And we're here to walk with you as well, to love you and, and to show you the love of God. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Pastor Arnold. How do I follow Jesus, you know? Um, I, we just got back from a retreat, and it was incredible. Um, and I want us to maybe share a couple of testimonies. But I'll start off by saying, um, you know, my this is not my this is not my normal voice. Uh, this is my um, prayer voice. Um, after you pray a little bit, I get I lose my voice. So, 
Um, it means I've been praying, so that's a good sign. Um, but Wednesday, I got a call from a young lady asked me if I could go pray for this man who was in the Air Force with us in an accident, and he had a back problem. It was pretty severe. So you had to get a surgery, but the surgeon messed up the surgery. So much they touched the nerve. It created so much pain. He had to go in for a second surgery for spinal fusion where some of the spinal columns had to be fused so that the pain, I, I don't want to speak too much on the medical things because we have a doctor here. And I'm just going to, I don't know what I'm going to, I'm not going to really understand this stuff, but it just created a lot of pain for him. Um, so much so that for seven years, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep except when his body would be so exhausted it would give out. And so he would um, take this medication. It says that it could knock out a horse. So every night he would have to take this medication, nerve relaxers and things like that. And so this man had been had a bit of severely uh, severe pain, more so than normal, in the past few weeks. And so this young lady was like, can you go pray for him? We're like, sure, we can. But in that moment, I heard in my spirit that said, if he forgave the surgeon and the church, that God would heal him. Um, those things are nervous. Um, those statements are kind of nerve-wracking because what if he does forgive and it, nothing happens, right? And so the next day we went on uh, to visit him while a lot of them, a lot of us went on evangelism, and we went to his house. His name is Richard, and so we started talking with him, and I just led him in a couple um, exercises of forgiveness, and he began to forgive, and he forgave two people, the surgeon and this other man named George, and then his wife was in having a, a moment, so he got up, and to console her upstairs, but we noticed that his movement got a lot freer. What we noticed after he came back, we said, I want to ask you to do something, Richard. Can you see if you can notice the pain, which was chronic and pervasive? He did not know a moment in a day where he did not experience that pain. I said, can you test it out? He started to notice that all the pain was completely gone. It was 100% gone, so much so that when his wife was going, was kind of confessing, she was sharing with us this deep trauma, and she was weeping, and I mean, she was, she was inconsolable. He couldn't pay attention to his wife talking because he kept testing his foot out to see if the pain was still there. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, not only did God heal Richard, but he healed his wife's heart too that day completely 100 percent and this is why we celebrate because this is our god Amen. he has the power to heal to set us free to deliver us salvation is real and that's why we celebrate amen amen, amen. and i want to open that up. i want to actually ask angel to come and share her testimony <laughs> Um, so I'm going to start from before I was born, actually, because I'm sorry, <laughs> because it's a, a real big, like, thing, and I guess that's kind of why I was born, I feel like. Um, before I was born, my uncle committed suicide, and his dad drunk himself to death and killed himself, pretty much, and so my family was upset and, like, wanted a miracle in life, and they didn't exactly pray, but, like, they would, like, wish, like, for a miracle, and when I was born, like, everyone was really happy about it. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, after I was born, I, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, um, when I was little, I went to church, but I didn't really go and, like, pay attention. Um, I used to get yelled out a lot in church. When I was little, um, I would have Bible fights <laughs> and, like, throw Bibles at people. <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, when I was five, I was coloring, like, Jesus or whatever, and I colored, like, him red, and the lady was yelling at me because he didn't die yet, <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't know. <laughs> um, 
So a lot of teenagers, they like, you know, a lot of times in society, teenagers are like drinking and smoking and all that stuff at like 15, 16. I was only like 10, 11, 12 years old doing all that. Um, I had that freedom from my parents and like, since my brothers were all a lot older than me, I was like, well, I wanna do it too. You know, like I had that influence. Um, <sighs> um, like, I believed in God, but I didn't believe in everything, and I just never really cared about it, really. So, um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, um, so, like, I would drink and party at a young age and didn't really care about myself, and I had a lot of hatred for people and, like, Christians. And, like, I used to think that you guys were all crazy, and, like, every person, really. And um, I used to just have a lot of hatred for people just because I was always hurt by people and bullied. And, like, I just wanted to kill myself and die a lot. Um, so, and, like, I was, um, after that, like, seventh grade, I was, um, I was going to church a lot. And... I didn't really know why I was going really, but I went because like my mom was, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And so I was just like, well, I just went to church to, to be around a lot of other people. And um, she's okay now, but <laughs> um, I was saved January 22nd, 2012. <laughs> I actually remember that. And like my life was starting to change and then I moved to North Carolina. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then um, school was stressful. People just, like, judged me because I was different, I guess. I mean, coming from up north to the south is really different because, like, the culture and, like, everyone's just different and they talk different. And <laughs> they do. I mean, now I talk like them. But <laughs> um, so, like, people judged me and all. And, like, I really wanted to, like, kill myself. And I attempted that three times, but I failed. And I never looked at it as, like, God didn't want me to die. It w I just looked at it as, like, well, I just failed, whatever. <laughs> um, so um, my freshman year of high school, um, things were getting better for me, I guess. And then I just got really depressed when my brother left because he wanted to go back to Pennsylvania because his girlfriend, which I thought was really stupid. And I was cutting again and really depressed because, like, my dad had to get um, hip surgery. And I always took care of my parents by myself. So <laughs> um, I just I felt, like, really alone and depressed. And, like, Abby was really, like, wanting me to come to church for, like, ever and I was like dude you're crazy do you not know me <laughs> and like I came and my first day here was mm, April 18th I actually remember the date no because it was the day after my dad's surgery but <laughs> um so I was really depressed that week and like when I came here I just I felt different I felt loved not like I didn't know what I was feeling really but it was different it wasn't like all the other churches I've been to and I was just really, like, s scared, kind of. Like, what is going on here? Why am I crying? <laughs> My makeup. <laughs> and, um, and then I was, I ca actually kept coming. <laughs> and I was like, why am I keep on coming? Like, this is weird. And, like, I mean, I was still struggling and depressed and all. And recently, like, a month ago, I made a covenant with God and, now I'm married to him, Amen. so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, and yeah, so recently, since school started, I've been struggling a lot because, like, there's these stupid rumors going around, and one of them was that I was against gay people now because I'm Christian, and I was like, that's highly impossible just because all my friends are gay, and, like, my favorite uncle's gay, and I just... I just didn't think, like, why people would think that just because I'm Christian. Like, they don't know me. And so 
a lot of people realized like how different I was when I went came back to school because I didn't like curse and like I really was focused on school and <laughs> like I've never focused on school. I never really cared for school and <laughs> um <laughs> and um, so, like, I just really didn't care about school and, like, the people in school. And I, I really don't really care about people. Well, not like that, but um, I just, I really just hate people in school just because, like, I was always so hurt by them. And that's why I really hated school, too. Like, I just felt always judged and, like, when I walk through the hallways, because my school's only a one hallway school, it's kind of weird, and there's only four, like, rooms, I think, four or six, but anyways, so, like, when I walk down the hall, I think of it as, like, my path to, like, this light of God, and, like, I'll go into a room, and I'm just like, oh, that's not the room I need to be in, go in this room, and eh, I don't need to be in that room, and it's like, go in this room, it's like a church, and I'm like, woo, church, <laughs> and, like, I don't know, I just, um, ah! <laughs> um, and, and, um, so, um, this week, like, last week, I was really, like, emotionally and, um, physically drained, just, like, I was just, like, tired and, I was really, like, I don't want to say depressed because I wasn't. I was just sad and, like, frustrated because, like, I don't know. I don't know why I was, but I was. And so, like, um, when the Visions team met in STEM, we went to McDonald's. And there's this person there. Um, he was, like, working. And, like, he was, like, I love you to Patrick, <laughs> which was really funny. But, anyways, um. I saw him at school the next day, and I was like, I saw you at McDonald's. And, like, his girlfriend was like, why'd you see him at McDonald's? And I was like, chill. <laughs> and, and, like, I was like, he was at work. But anyways, and he was like, I was going to come over there and talk to you guys. But I was, he was like, I didn't want to intrude. And I was like, dude, whatever. And I was like, you should have came to us. And he recently found God this summer. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, oh, my gosh, amen. And all my friends were like, <laughs> what? <laughs> and, <laughs> and so um, this morning I got to talk to him. Like, I was texting him, and he was saying how, like, he didn't really understand, like, God's love and how it was unconditional. And I was like, it is unconditional. Like, it's different because no matter what, he still loves you. And, like, I struggle with that. Because, like, I felt like after I sinned so many times that, like, he wouldn't love me anymore, that he would just not care about me and stuff. And then, like, after talking to him about that, I was like, no, his love is unconditional. Shut up, Angel. <laughs> and so, yeah, and he might be coming Friday. Yeah, so... Um, the way that the power of God and the grace of God becomes activated in our lives is when we are able to forgive as well. And there is no separation between forgiving others and receiving forgiveness because the logic of grace is one. And, Angel, will you forgive your classmates in school who are speaking death over you and speaking nasty things over you because those aren't true? Will you forgive them? Will you? Will you ima imagine they're imagine they're your schoolmates right there. <laughs> Make angry faces. Um, can you can you forgive them? Because there's power in that. Oh yeah, I forgive them. I mean, oh, what? Specific things. Um, I forgive for them just calling me a slut and a whore just because the way I dress and the way I act, I guess, for calling me preppy because, I don't know, <laughs> I guess because I talk quiet and cute or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I forgive.
perspective um, for just being cruel and mean and telling me to kill myself and just, <laughs> just like being just rude and disrespectful just because I was new and to test me and see how far I would go with it all and just, yeah. Amen. 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 So we forgive, Lord, um, all the horrible words. We, Lord, we bind those words right now. Lord Jesus, they will not have any impact or force in angel's life. Lord, you speak a different word over her, my daughter, my warrior, my princess, my beautiful one, my favorite one, my representative, one that I honor, one that I love. Lord Jesus, in that love, Lord God, we declare freedom over the school. We forgive them for they do not know what they do. So we ask the logic of grace to fall upon that school. And that, Lord Jesus, many will turn to know Christ, the hope of glory, Lord Jesus, especially through angel. So, Lord God, we speak life over our sister, and we ask that your spirit go with her, God. And, Lord Jesus, for she is not alone, but she goes with you, your spirit, and the entire church, and the body universal, billions of people, in fact, actually, in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thanks, Angel. Um, I thought that was really appropriate um, segue into the word today because I, I think that Lord is speaking to us a different message, and I think we're in a different season. And one of the words that God is speaking to us is, is that we have completed the first season of harvest. We're going to enter into the next one. And one of the ways that I think God has verify that is at the retreat that we had 100% uh, success rate, I don't know if that's a good word, but of seeing people come to know Christ. There was not one person who came to the retreat who did not know Christ, left not knowing Christ. Every single person that needed to know Christ came to know Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And I believe that was the first um, deposit of the first harvest or the second harvest that God will bring to us. But one of the things that I think we have to understand in our ministry is that we have experienced a lot of amazing things where many of us come out of really, really dark places and horribly broken lives. And like people coming out of Egypt, Israelites coming out of Egypt, we saw God's mighty hand deliver us from that place and we've been set free out of the land of Egypt and out of its bondage and sent forth to be able to go into our promised land and we have experienced that so powerfully and we want to enter that story um, from Exodus 13 this morning as we journey with Israelites into what God is doing so if you turn with me to Exodus 13 Verse 17. If you found it, please look up and I'll read it for us. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter, for God said, if they face war, they might not change, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Amen. What we see is that um, Israelites as they're coming out of this bondage, out of brokenness, out of depression, out of drugs, out of, you know, broken lives, abortions, and countless other things that we come out of, they were going and, you know, there were, can you imagine millions of people from first time in 500 years set free from bondage and they had tasted freedom and they were on the road to their own freedom without any hindrance. Can you imagine this procession? Millions of people celebrating 
first freedom they have tasted in 500 years. Can you imagine the celebration and the joy and, you know, the songs and cheerings and, you know, I'm sure it looked like this times million, just the ruckus that they would have erupted on that road. It would have been just a scene. But in the midst of it, I think God saw something that they did not see. That God understood something that they couldn't see in the midst of their exuberant celebration was that the things that they were afraid, the things that brought them to bondage was not completely free. That they were not completely free of the things that, that brought them into bondage in the first place. And that they were yet tested and certain of their strength in the Lord. So if they faced dangers or if they face challenges and trials they would turn back and go back to that place of bondage which from which they once came so what the lord did was kept them safe from facing trials and testing and difficulties and hardship because he said he knew what was in them in the midst of all the celebration even shouting and joy and dancing and that's, I think, many ways the way that God has kept many of us in our journey to our own freedom. God has kept many of us for a very long time from testing, uh, from too many difficult things. Because he knew in us that if we began to face the real difficult challenges of life, then we'll turn back to Egypt and run from the Pharaoh's army. But one thing I know about Christianity in 20-some years of journey with our God is that liberation does not happen without a fight. That true freedom does not come without a cost. For many of us, we want freedom, but we, want, we don't want the fight. But one thing I promise is that when Pharaoh, the enemy of God, he was shocked and he was dismayed by the overwhelming display of God's power that set the Israelites free. But when he came to his senses, when he awoke from the spell of God's fear that fell upon the land of Egypt, when the fear of God lifted, when Israelites left, then the Pharaoh's own inner self and the demons that once held him captive awoke from his sleep and he came to his senses and this is what he says in verse 10 keep your finger in exodus because we're going to journey together through chapter 15 chapter 13 verse 10 it says uh, nope, sorry, chapter 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. I'm oh, sorry, well, from read verse 5. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officers changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariots made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots among, along with all the other um, chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the hearts of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen, troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hehiroth opposite of Baal Zephon. What we see is that Israelites were marching boldly and confidently without fear because they did not face opposition and they were going towards the promised land without any fear. They were confident and bold until the Pharaoh and his chariots faced them and began to overtake them. And the circumstances for Israelites was more than overwhelming because they were caught between a rock and a hard place or they were caught between the Red Sea and the incoming army of the Pharaoh. 
they saw the overwhelming odds of Pharaoh coming at them full force without mercy. Now, only was Pharaoh upset about is letting Israelites go, but now the anger for his uh, embarrassment burned towards Israelites, and the fury would only find end by consuming and destroying every Israelite alive. And some of us, as we walk towards our own freedom in God, began to face pharaohs of our past we thought we were once free from and i promise if you haven't faced the things that you've been set free from they will come back your way like angel as she began to step into freedom and began to declare to others her freedom boldly there comes an attack the school, the small school, began to gang up on her, began to persecute her because it's not just them but the devil and demonic spirits wanting to destroy her witness. Every time we step into proclaiming who Jesus Christ is in our lives, what he's doing, the enemy wants to do nothing more than to destroy that witness and disrep uh, disgrace the very thing that you testify for. And so when we step into freedom from drugs, guess what temptation comes your way? Drugs. If you testify about freedom from pornography and sexual addictions, guess what temptations come your way? Ex-girlfriends or somebody else. Because the devil and the enemy wants to destroy your witness. And there will certainly come trials and tribulations that will seem overwhelming at times. But I want us to see what scripture says. Israelites in that moment began to panic, didn't they? Let's look at verse uh, 10 and onwards. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. And there were the Egyptians marching after them by number and force and fury. And the Israelites, they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Then we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians rather than to die in the desert. And this is sometimes our response, isn't it? And I heard more than once uh, people coming to me and say, you know, Pastor Arnold, this is so hard. I didn't really sign up for this. This trials and temptation that's coming my way, I don't know if I can handle it. And some people say, you know, it might be better if I go back to my old life. At least I didn't have this struggle. And for some, they went back. But only if they knew the promise of God. Only if we knew the word of God and the power of God. Let's look at what verse 13 says. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm. You'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The additions you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Can we read it together? Because it's a really important passage. Guys, if you're struggling with whatever today, can we declare this over yourselves? I could tell some of us are struggling with loneliness and depression. I think that's a word for today. Struggling with addictions and trials. They're coming back to haunt you and get back to you. Can we declare these words over ourselves today? Verse 13, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you'll see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Amen. Amen. Here are three principles that I think we have to see. One, the Lord says, do not be afraid. 
Do not be afraid. The enemy that you see, do not be afraid of it. Take courage. And second principle is stand firm. If God has spoken promise of freedom over your life, God's promise is certain. He will not betray his word. It's not in him to betray his word. Stand firm in the promise of God, and you will see salvation. If God has spoken certain words over you, and you're waiting for that word to be fulfilled, the Lord says in third principle, wait upon him. Wait upon the Lord. So do not be afraid. Stand firm and wait upon the Lord. Can we say that? Stand firm. Do not be afraid and wait upon the Lord. Amen? Because if we do this, not because the circumstances is not powerful or overwhelming, And I do not know all of your circumstances and the things that you go through. And I do not want to minimize what you're experiencing. I do not know how to do that. I do not know what Angel's going through. And I don't want to minimize what she's going through. But I do know that God sees her in the midst of that pain and suffering. He's not turning blind and eyes saying, strap your bootstraps and then stand up and fight like a man. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, stand tall and trust in the word of God. Not because he doesn't see your circumstances or problems. But he's saying, I am greater than your problems. He's saying, I am more powerful than any trials that you are going through. But only thing you have to do is to stand firm, believe, do not fear, and wait upon the Lord. He's saying, do not be afraid. Stand firm and wait upon the Lord. And for far too many of us in this generation, that's a microwave generation, if the, if the Lord doesn't solve our problems in 30 seconds or less, then we say, God, where are you? You have abandoned me. Do you not see I'm going to die? We tend to be a little dramatic, are we not? We're not going to die because if we wait Upon the Lord, he will deliver us. Amen. I know some of us right now are going through things, right? Can we just close our eyes for a moment? And I know for many of us, we get caught up in our circumstances, and we look at the circumstances and we get overwhelmed. But can we hear what the Lord is saying to us today? He's saying, do not be afraid. Not because your circumstances are not terrifying. But he's saying, because I'm greater. Do not be afraid. Stand firm in the promises. Stand firm in the promise that I say. That will deliver you from this circumstance. And will you wait upon me? If you resolve in your heart to do that, I promise you'll see the glory of God being revealed in your life. And your enemies will certainly experience defeat. Amen. The reason the enemy seems to come back sometimes is not because the Lord didn't defeat it, but we didn't wait upon the Lord long enough. We get impatient, and I hate waiting as much as anybody else. But the Lord is saying very clearly, you must wait. Stand your ground. and Do not be afraid. Amen? And... 
if most of the story that we're told in our, in our lives, like um, fairy tales, then the story should end by saying the Israelites lived happily ever after. Like most of my, uh, most of the stories I read my daughter, you know, the princess then lived with the princess uh, happily ever after. And, you know, they had a, the two and a half kids and a white picket fence and a, you know, Ferrari in their garage. Um, but the scripture is not a fairy tale. And if scripture told us such a story, then I think I wouldn't believe the scripture as much because that's not how life goes. Because even after we are set free from trials and our greatest battles, there are more trials to be faced, isn't there? And I, and I think the scripture tells us this, and it's interesting. If you look at chapter 15, it's an incredible testimony and worship, especially by Moses and Miriam, testifying to the glory and the wonder and the power of God. Especially if you read from verse 12, 11, you can see and hear the incredible joyful thanksgiving in the Lord. Verse 11 says, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. In your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. Philistia. Let's jump to verse 17. You will bring them in, in and plant them on the mount of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. The Lord reigns forever and ever. Hallelujah and amen. It's awesome. And so there, Israelites are singing this praise and wonderful chorus to the Lord. But no sooner than the worship ends, that the last chord is being played, then we begin to face a problem in chapter 15. And let's read uh, starting chapter 15, uh, starting verse 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. Uh-oh. When they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became fit to drink. This is often our experience, isn't it? Even after we won, we win a great victory, and we're singing praises, and perhaps even when the service is over, you step out, and all of a sudden you get a call or you get an attack in your emotion, and all of a sudden the troubles start to creep back in. And you begin to cry out, it would have been better, perhaps, if I never began to follow Jesus. But we have to understand a principle once we start on this journey, there are only two roads. One is to continue to the promised land. Or one, the other, is to go back to land of Egypt to our own bondage. There is no other way out. Lukewarm Christianity is not an option. A foot in the door of God's house, a foot, another foot in the door of the world is not an option for Christians. Either we go all the way to the promised land or you go back to the prisons to which we came from and there is no option. And I remember when I went to Marine Corps boot camp, they told me you leave my island one of two ways. Either as a Marine or in a body bag, the choice is yours. I said, okay, I would like to be a Marine, please. Um, please? And so the choice is ours. And I'm not saying there will not be trials and tribulations. And if somebody or I sold you or Christianity that was comfortable, that is supposed to be without problems or pain, 
is a false Christianity that is not the Christianity of the Bible, and I'm terribly sorry. But the Christianity the scripture talks about is not one where we can compromise. Either we go all the way to the promised land or we die in the desert. There is no compromise. If the trials come our way, we must continue to exercise the principle, stand firm, do not be afraid, and wait upon the Lord because we shall see the glory of the living God. Luke 14 is unequivocal about what discipleship looks like. He says, take up your cross and come follow me. If you want to be my follower, you must hate your mother, father, your brother, and your sister. You must hate even your own life before you can be called my disciple. And Jesus goes on to say, if you are to be a follower, begin to count your cause. Because if you begin to build a house and you don't finish it because you don't count how much it's going to actually cost, then people come by and mock it. But the truth is, when people look at unfinished Christian lives, people do not mock us, but they mock our God. The empty churches and powerless programs continue to point to powerless and failed Christianity that brings shame to the name of Jesus Christ. And this is not the Christianity that the scripture invites us into. It says count your cost. Are you willing to pay the cost necessary to run all the way to the end? I remember John and I used to have these conversations all the time. When John began to take this seriously, he used to just go, how many people really understand what this means, Pastor Arnold? How many people do really understand how much this actually cost? The grace is free, but discipleship costs us our lives. And if we are not willing to stand and fight at every trial that comes our way, just because our emotions begin to get caught up, and if trials begin to come our way, we say this is too hard, then perhaps we need to go back to Egypt. God is looking for those who are willing to follow him into the promised land to build his kingdom. Because you cannot build the kingdom of God in the desert. The desert sucks. It does. I'm not minimizing it. Desert is dry, it's hot, it's, it's painful, it's, you're hungry and you're thirsty. And it's, it's, it's not good. I understand. But God is saying count the cost. And this morning, I want us to begin to count the cost of following God into the promised land. Because what we are beginning to see is that as soon as the excitement, the miracle of God began to fade, we'll begin to see and having to deal with the reality of the desert, the journey that we must embark upon. Even for some of us from the retreat, the high will begin to fade away. And for some of us, the desert reality began to creep back in last night or even the driveway back. But what Moses led Israelites understood in their experience was that if you wait upon the Lord, not be afraid and stand firm, you'll see God's salvation. One thing that we have to learn as, as the body is that unless we learn to overcome the conditions of the desert, we'll never make it to the promised land. Let me say that again. Unless we Learn to overcome the conditions of the desert. We'll never make it to the promised land. The desert is hard, I understand. But I think God is inviting us to count the cost today. Amen.
The first step of obedience is not the most difficult one, but the collective million steps that you take to the promised land is. In other words, the slow, painful process of discipleship is going to be a journey for us. The first obedience step that brought us out of bondage, it was only the first one, and that's not the most difficult one. But the one, the journey that faces us, the journey that we must face now becomes the difficult one. And are we willing to pay the cost? Are we willing to go all the way to the promised land? And when we begin to cry out in the promised land or in the desert, God begins to answer us. And I want us to look at um, chapter 15, verses um, 22, I believe. Twenty-five. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. Amen. And when the moments when we experience pain and we suffering and uh, pushback, when we cry out to the Lord, God will make a way out. Praise the Lord. But this is not the Christianity where we only serve him when we are in trouble. But I believe God is calling us to a new standard of Christianity that will begin to follow him not only when we are in trouble and difficulties, but out of our own choice we begin to follow Christ because what he is and who he is. If we look at the following verses, um, verses 15, second part of 15, uh, 20, uh, 25, let us read. There the Lord issued a ruling, instructions for them, and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought you on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Amen. I believe in this new season for us, God is raising up the standard for us to follow. Not only out of pain and suffering, God is inviting us to look at who he is. And in that, he's saying that follow all of my instructions and keep my ways. And then I will show you a new promise and a new land. And he will begin to heal us, not when we cry out of pain, but we begin to follow and obey him because we believe that he is good. And our full commitment to him began to result in the power of God, began to transform the broken structures of our lives. And this is the promise of God. God will meet us even when we cry out. It's sporadically. We continue to walk our own way, do our own thing. But we say, Jesus, I need you when things get hard. And God will meet us there. And he is faithful. But God's saying, it's time for us to take on a new standard. He's saying it's time for us to understand a new vision of Christianity that is not sporadic or circumstantial. Only call out to him when you only need him, but begin to follow him because you believe that he is good and worthy of your life. He says here, if you follow me and if you listen carefully to the Lord and do what God asks you and do what is right in his eyes if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees and you take his word and bind it in your heart put it in your forehead put it around your wrist and meditate on day to night and follow his precepts what God says in verse 27 then they will come to a place of Elim where there will be 12 springs and 70 palm trees they encamped Near the water, God will bring you to a place of peace and rest. And I believe that God is calling us to a new standard. I believe God has brought us out of land of Egypt. And God has done amazing things in this ministry. And we are a miracle indeed. But we haven't accomplished anything. We have only just begun. 
And I believe God is raising a new standard of righteousness and purity. He's raising a new standard of sacrifice and martyrdom. He's raising the standard of discipline and faithfulness. And he's saying, will you follow me into this land? Michael, we've been praying about this, so I'll let Michael share a little bit. Yeah, so the question becomes, is it worth it? Is it worth it for me to go into the promised land? And I believe we can answer that question when we begin to determine in our hearts, how are we going to live? Are we going to live for what we desire in our hearts? Or are we going to live for what God desires in his heart? And one of the things that we were talking about yesterday at the very end of the retreat was that we're in the midst of very tough times. It's going to be very glorious, but it's also going to be very difficult. Difficult because of the trials and the persecutions that we'll have to go through as we continue walking with God, but glorious because he's going to reveal his glory through us, the church. And so we really want to ask God to help us to come to a place where we're beholding him and where we lay down the desire in our hearts to live for ourselves and to simply live for his glory. And so I want to share from a passage that the Lord gave me in my devotions back when I was an undergrad. Acts chapter 9. Saul encounters Jesus and realizes that for all of his life, he's been living on the wrong side. He's been persecuting the very ones that God loves and the ones that God was using to reveal his glory in the earth. And for three days, Paul goes without sight, neither eating nor drinking. And Jesus appears to Ananias and says in verse 11, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And Ananias is, is terrified because he knows about Saul. And that's how it's going to be for some of us, God's going to call us to go forth and uh, to reveal his love to those that seem so intimidating. But when God calls us, we must hear the reason that he's calling. And so Jesus tells Ananias in verse 15, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my namesake. God's original intention for Saul who became Paul was to use him as a chosen vessel to reveal God's glory in the earth. And you know, the Lord gave me this passage when I was an undergrad and I, I was really wrestling with it because, you know, I, some of the things that he was speaking to me during that time I didn't really want to go through. And I remember my college pastor driving me back to my apartment one night and I start weeping. I began sharing a dream with her and just began sharing like, I feel like the Lord's calling me to something that I don't want to do. But as I began wrestling with the Lord, trying to understand what is he really doing, he began to take me through a series of different circumstances between about 2009 to 2011, 2012 that really began to cultivate in my heart a desire to lay down my life for his sake. And I began to understand the greater glory that is revealed in the earth when we're willing to lay it all down to follow Jesus. When we're willing to count the cost and say it's worth it to follow Jesus all the way. 
And we see this in Acts 9 because all of a sudden when Ananias prays for Paul, the scales fall off of his eyes. He gets baptized in the spirit and all of a sudden he begins to get strengthened. And he goes forth and he begins to confound people with the wisdom of God. And he's leading people with G- to Jesus. And in the midst of all of this great glory, there's persecution that comes. People begin to plot to kill him. But it was not God's time to take Paul out to be with him in eternal glory. And so Paul continues persevering. And we see by the time we reach verse 31, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. And all of a sudden, we begin to see that through Paul being willing to go through whatever it took he had to go through, God was using him to reveal more of his goodness into all of the cities around And I know for some of us that I was talking to during the retreat or even before that, some of you have been wrestling with different things that God has called you to do, thinking this is too difficult. But as I was going through some of the things I was going through from 2009 to 2011 and 12, I began to think about the Moravians and how they sold themselves into slavery Because they wanted the lamb to receive the reward due his suffering. They were willing to simply let go of living a comfortable life so that God could receive his reward. So that the goodness of the gospel could go forth and people's lives could be changed. And we see it even now in the Middle East with everything that's happening with Israel and and Gaza and everything and the beheadings of the children. These are tough times. But in Revelation, Jesus says that we will overcome through the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives unto death. And so there are times when God will call us literally to, to lay down our lives physically, or to simply die to self so that we will sacrifice and serve someone else so that they begin to be touched by the love of God. And so what was happening for me was um, at the end of my sophomore year, I had failed a bunch of my chemistry classes. I was really struggling with science classes during that time. And I came home, um, and my parents were very angry, very upset. And my parents are still not believers yet. Um, But the warfare between uh, my parents and I was very intense during that time. And uh, so I came home that summer, and uh, I just remember just so much verbal abuse for two to three weeks straight. I'd be asleep, and my dad would walk into the room, turn on the lights, and start yelling at me, telling me that the God that I serve is not the real God. My parents took my Bible and hid it from me so that I couldn't have access to it, and just all these different things. And eventually they said, that they weren't going to pay anymore for me to go back to school at UNC and that I needed to renounce Jesus. And I had come to a place where I knew in my heart that Jesus had changed my life and that there was no way that I would renounce the one who gave me hope, the one who gave me eternal life. But I didn't know I was going through what I was going through, and so I kept wrestling. I I was still at home, and after they had said that, I I still didn't renounce Jesus, but I didn't know what to do. And I kept on praying. And and during that time period, I felt like I was hitting a glass ceiling. It was like my prayers were going up, and I couldn't feel any, like, response from God. I was like, God, where are you? But the amazing thing is my church, they, they took time on a Sunday, and they prayed corporately. They just stopped the service, and they prayed for me. And it felt like heaven opened up over my house. Because I remember going to sleep one night after not hearing the Lord for about two to three weeks. I'm in bed. And I start weeping, and the Lord says to me, Michael, if you leave home, I'll bless you. And as a result, two of my friends ended up coming down from Chapel Hill to Charlotte and picked me up. They met my parents and listened to my mom tell them about me and how bad of a son I was and how I was being brainwashed by Christianity and all these different things. And my friends just stuck up for me, and they said, we believe that Michael's making the right decision to follow God. And you're going to know in the future why. And so they drive me back up to Chapel Hill, and I'm really wrestling with, God, what are you calling me to do next? And my friend Brian, he's asking me, so what do you want to do from here? And I begin praying, and I knew the Lord was calling me to finish school, even though I didn't want to go back to school. Um, And so long story short with that, um, 
<laughs> Thank you. Long story short with that, um, the Lord provided all the finances that I needed to go back to school. Um, but what I really want to focus on is what the Lord produced in that trial and how it came about to release his glory. And so I was also signed up for a mission trip to China and Korea that summer um, after this happened. And the day before I needed to fly out, I still needed $900. And a dentist from the church calls me and asks me, Michael, I've been praying for you. How much money do you need? And I said, I need $900. And he paid for it all. So all of a sudden, I'm on a plane the next day flying to China. And we're wearing these gospel bracelets when we're there teaching English. And the gospel bracelets had like these different colors, like red representing the blood, black representing sin, green representing growth, all these different colors. And the purpose of it was to initiate conversation. Because when we were in China, we weren't allowed to initiate conversation with the students to talk to them about Jesus. But if they asked us questions about Jesus, we could begin to just go off. And I remember just after everything I had gone through and the Lord bringing me out, I was at a place in my walk with the Lord then where I was like, if I just have to die, you know, or go to prison for the sake of the gospel, I'm willing to. And so all of a sudden, I'm in China with this holy boldness from the Spirit of God. And I remember one day taking some of my students outside. We're under a tree, and I'm teaching um, just to my students, and I start flashing my arm, my bracelet to, like, all the guys, trying to get them to, like, ask me a question. And finally, one of them is like, why do you keep wearing that bracelet? And I was like, yes. And so I begin sharing my testimony with them and sharing the gospel. And it was like my words were bouncing off of their hearts and then bouncing back at me. It was like it was just falling on stony ground. But I remember looking to the side, and I saw this girl named Nancy, and she starts weeping. And so I go over to her because I knew that she was ready to receive something. So I begin sharing my testimony and the gospel message again with her. And all of a sudden, I ask her, do you want to receive Jesus? And she starts nodding, and we start praying together. And all of a sudden, her countenance just changes. And she, it was just like she transformed right before my eyes. And so I continue praying with her. We were working with two underground missionaries in, um, in China at that time. And I began sharing with them what had happened, and I was praying for Nancy, and the Lord began speaking to me right before we left for Korea, and he said, I want you to tell her about persecution. And so all of a sudden, the two ladies that we were working with from the underground house church give me a Chinese Bible and say to me, give this to her as a gift. So I meet with her an hour before I'm supposed to get on a train to Korea, and we're just talking, and I begin sharing with her everything that my parents had just done, and... Um, I just start sharing with her that it's worth it. It's worth it to lay down our lives for Jesus, even if we go to, through persecution, even if we go to prison, even if we lose our life, it's worth it. Because there's a greater purpose in what we go through. And then she began weeping, and I asked her, do you understand what I'm saying to you? And she began to nod, and she said yes. And she gave me a hug, and she was crying. And then I was on my way to, to Korea and then after I got back from that trip, she emailed me a few times, but I didn't hear back from her after a few months. But I know that the Lord brought me through that trial simply to pursue one person that needed to hear the love of God. And now, because of that, she's going to be in eternity, and we'll be able to see each other again. And that's what it's like, you know? When we lay down our lives for the gospel, for the sake of Jesus, he begins to use our trials as a witness for those around us so that he can reveal something even deeper. There is a joy when we get to fellowship in the sufferings of Christ. And so, I wish I had more time, but I have to take these ladies back to UNC. Um, so I just want to close with, it's worth it. And, and maybe at another point I can share the whole testimony. But it's worth it to follow Jesus all the way. And if you're wrestling with that, I really challenge you to wrestle until you have a full assurance that whatever God calls you to, you can go through it. Be like Jacob, who wrestled with God until he received the blessing. Don't stop wrestling with God until you know in the depths of your heart that it's worth it to go into the promised land.
Because if you know without a shadow of a doubt that it's worth it, going back to the land of Egypt does not look like an option anymore. You just keep on pressing in no matter what the cost. One of the things that we want to, let's just give a round of applause. Thank you, Michael. We really s sense that, that, God, that God is saying to us that we are in a new season and we have to get ready to be able to handle persecution that come our way. It's not normal for a young lady to say that I'm a Christian and be persecuted by her schoolmates. That used to be not the norm for us in this country, but it is becoming the norm. The persecution that is coming this way is certain and sure. The question becomes, are you ready to endure to the end? Bye, guys. Bye, UNC Chapel Hill. And so one of the questions that we are faced with in our ministry today, I believe that we are at a place where God is calling us to, to a greater understanding of sacrifice and commitment, a willingness to a new levels of righteousness and purity, and willingness to endure persecution. But if we're not ready to be able to go through difficulties and learn through fight through difficulties, then we'll never be able to withstand actual persecution. And if we are not willing to stand for Christ at the end of the day, Christ says, I will deny you as you deny me. And I, one thing I believe that in our next stage of maturation as a ministry is that we began to build our foundation on a different one than one we have built so far, which is an experience of God, which has been great. God has given us freedom. God has given us joy. God has given us taste of heaven. God has given us miracles, healings, um, prophetic words. I mean, we have seen incredible things that we could only dream of. But what God is saying is that the next season, the foundation won't be built upon your experience, but on your sacrifice and willingness to commit to Christ for who he is. And this is the new standard I believe that God is calling us to. And I want us to reflect upon that this morning. And if you're new to the ministry, hello and welcome. And two, that I believe this is what God is taking us as a ministry. And we'd like to invite you there. It's not just Christianity based upon, oh, God, make me feel good. God, can you satisfy me? But a Christianity that says, Jesus, you are worthy of it all. Jesus, you're worthy of my sacrifices and my life, if it may be. So I want us to begin to reflect upon that this morning. And we're going to begin to raise a standard higher instead of, I love you, which is true, but not just I love you, but now can you begin to follow Christ at all costs. I want to invite the praise band and just to begin to play some music for us. And I want us to have a time of ministry where we begin to reflect upon that a little bit.